everyone, this is Nick and I got my hands on an HP Dev 1. That laptop made in collaboration with HP and System76 that runs Pop! OS out of the box. And without spoiling anything, I can definitely tell you that it's a very, very good device that might even make ThinkPad lovers rethink their next purchase. If they live in the US, that is. And before anyone jumps to conclusion, no, I wasn't paid to say that, this video isn't sponsored either by HP or System76. It's also a bit of a historical laptop, because it's the first time that a big manufacturer has designed a notebook from the ground up to work with Linux. It's not a Windows machine that's also sold with Ubuntu or Fedora, like we can see on other manufacturers. This thing has been designed from the start to run Linux. So let's take a look at the hardware, how well the software has been integrated, and I'll even sprinkle in some little tidbits of information about how System76 and HP collaborated on this one. Just like I love collaborating with today's sponsor, which is going to let you get a free study on the state of security on Linux. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare, but this time I'm not going to talk to you about their services to handle and manage your Linux server fleet. This time, they want you to take a look at a report that they sponsored about Linux security best practices. This research was conducted by the independent Ponemon Institute, and the results, which are freely downloadable, will let you benchmark your processes against a set of best practices. For example, research shows that organizations spend about 1,075 man-hours monitoring and patching systems each week including 340 hours of downtime to apply those patches. 45% of respondents also indicated that their organization has no tolerance for system patching downtime. Of course, that's a problem that Tuxcare solves with their live patching services, but if you want to learn more about Linux security best practices, how to implement them in your organization, head over to the link in the description below and download the full report for free. No strings attached. Okay, let's begin with the hardware, because the HP Dev1 is an absolute beauty. The Dev1 is a device that targets developers, but it is definitely suitable for everyone else as well, although it has that pro look to it. It's made out of aluminium, and the chassis is very rigid, with almost no deck flex at all. It looks pretty good in that Apple-esque space grey color, and there's a metallic HP logo on the back and under the display. The screen is covered in glass and has a very sturdy hinge, so sturdy that you can't open it with one finger. The chassis is very resistant to fingerprints, so it won't look too dirty after a few weeks of use, and it's also relatively resistant to scratches. The device itself has a wedge shape, and it's pretty thin, at less than 2 cm at its thickest point. It weighs less than 1.5 kg, although it does feel relatively heavy and solid. That's 3 quarters of an inch for thickness and 3.24 pounds for weight if you live in an area where standard units don't apply. Of course, it has two small stickers, but they're easy to remove if, like me, you hate these sticky little bastards. But the best part is, it's user serviceable. You can open the back by removing the 5 screws and upgrade the RAM and storage, or just completely dismantle it. As a matter of fact, the first units they sent System76 for testing was just a box of spare parts that they had to assemble themselves. So I guess that's pretty reassuring in terms of how maintainable and repairable it really is. And it seems derived from a line of laptops at HP that regularly get a 8 to 9 out of 10 by iFixit. It's simply a very well-built laptop. I would say not quite on par with the latest MacBooks from Apple, because there is a bit more deck flex than these devices, but it's a very reassuring laptop. You won't feel like it's going to twist, bend or break when you drop it or carry it around. On to the hardware it packs, and let's start with the display. It's covered in glass, and so it's pretty reflective and susceptible to fingerprints, although there is no reason to touch it as it's not a touchscreen. It's 14 inch at 1920 by 1080, and it can go up to a thousand nits of brightness, which is pretty high. Although, again, the glass cover does reduce that brightness a bit, about 20%, according to HP. It's sharp and it's got good color accuracy, but it's definitely not a laptop you will want to take outside too much. The glass isn't anti reflective, and so you're going to see yourself or just the light around you quite a bit. 
For inside work, it's absolutely good enough. Hey, they made this for developers. Do you know a developer that likes to go outside? I thought they all lived in little basements with tons of cables and RGB everywhere. Okay, I'll stop now. The bezels are relatively large for today's standards, but they're nothing to complain about. And the top one hosts a 720p webcam with a privacy shutter included, which is cool. No need for duct tape or post-it notes. That webcam is your usual potato quality. It's not full HD, it's a bit grainy, and it doesn't handle lighting very well. The microphone isn't bad at all though, although you'll want to drop the mic volume in GNOME to avoid it distorting. And it still picks up any keyboard activity and the fan noise, even though it's not very distracting. As always, this is an area I wish they would spend a little bit more time on. Like, microphones and webcams are often overlooked. Now for video conferencing, it's definitely going to be suitable, but it's not fantastic. Let's move on to the I.O. On the left side, you have your Kensington lock and two USB-A ports that go up to 5 gigabits per second, as well as the holy headphone jack. On the right side, you have the port for the barrel charger included in the box, an HDMI 2.0 port and two USB-C 10 gigabit per second that also support DisplayPort and charging. Which is good because since it's only available in the US, it came with a US power plug and I lost my adapter. So thankfully it charges through USB-C or that review would have been delayed. Oh, and also it supports fast charging. So you can top up 50% of the battery in 30 minutes. The speakers are really good and don't distort at all, even on max volume. They have enough bass to sound right and they won't let you down if you want to watch a video, a movie or for conferencing. Good job on that often overlooked part. Moving on to the keyboard and trackpad, whether you like these inputs or not will depend on whether you like ThinkPads or not. The keyboard is fantastic either way. The keys have full travel, they're well spaced and they make an appropriately clicky noise. The keys feel very solid, they're very stable, they actuate well and even the space bar when you press it on the very side. The function row works as a function keys first, so you'll have to press the FN key to get F1, F2 and the likes, unless you change that in the BIOS of course. I personally prefer it the way it is by default. And then you have that little knob in the middle of the keyboard. Look, I never could use or understand these things. They just feel completely imprecise and weird and they force my hand to cramp in uncomfortable positions. But if you're used to them, I guess it's cool to have it. The acceleration curve seems a bit high to me with the slightest movement of my finger jerking the mouse cursor all over the place but it might just be me not being used to using that thing. The touchpad appropriately has two buttons on top, so you can click while using the knob, but that unfortunately reduces the surface for touchpad users like me, and there is no clickable middle button. Still, that touchpad is really, really good. It's covered in glass and it's extremely smooth for gestures, although Pop! OS uses X11 by default, so you don't get the smooth one-to-one -one gestures that GNOME introduced recently. You still have gestures, but they're not as nice to use. So I guess if you swear by the little knob, you're gonna have a good experience with it. And if you don't like it, you're not that worse off for its presence. So I think it's good either way. In terms of internals, the Dev1 only comes in one configuration, a Ryzen 7 Pro 5850U, 16 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte of storage. But you can upgrade the RAM and the storage yourself after the fact. The CPU is 8 core 16 threads and has a base clock of 1.9 GHz up to 4.4 when boosting. It's a very, very powerful beast indeed, with a Geekbench score of 1550 in single score and 7707 in multi-core. This definitely will get you through any task or code compilation you need to do. It even beats my desktop Ryzen 7 5800X in single core, although in multi-core the desktop still has the edge. It is a very, very powerful chip. And being of the U line of the AMD Ryzen CPUs, it focuses on low TDP and battery life, which we'll see in a minute is really good. Now, this laptop isn't aimed at gamers and its integrated graphics aren't anything special. I ran Shadow of the Tomb Raider on it and at 1080p on medium settings, the benchmark ran only at around 20 FPS. 
Lowering things to low graphics resulted in the game reaching about 25 FPS, not really playable. If you lower the resolution at 720p, then you start getting much better performance, and it's not horrible to look at on a 14-inch screen. On Resident Evil 2, performance is a bit better. At 1080p on medium, you hover a bit under 30 FPS, and on low settings, you definitely achieve a solid 30 FPS at 1080p once the shaders have been compiled, as it's a game running with Proton. So yeah, it's still an integrated graphics component from a CPU. It's on par with what you would expect. It's not terrible, but it's not great. And for less demanding games, it's definitely going to do the trick. As per battery life, I left the laptop on a YouTube loop with Firefox over Wi-Fi at mid-brightness, and it lasted for eight and a half hours before shutting down. On a more typical workload, I used it to write scripts using Firefox and Nextcloud notes, listening to music and Wi-Fi on, Bluetooth mouse connected at mid-brightness, and it lasted for seven hours. So on the hardware front, I was kind of positively surprised. I hear horror stories about HP laptops often in the comments, but this, this does not reflect those horror stories at all. It's super well built, it's very sturdy. The CPU choice is probably the right mix between power and power consumption, You've got an awesome keyboard, great trackpad, that little nub if you need it, and the screen, webcam, and mics aren't amazing, but they're definitely good enough. Okay, let's move on to the software. The dev one runs Pop! OS 22.04, and there's been a lot of work done by both teams on that front. System76 collaborated with HP to deliver the same image for Pop! OS as the one you can download off the internet, except that it will auto-detect the dev one and install everything needed to ensure it works great. The integration goes up to the support as well. Just like a System76 laptop, you can create a support ticket right from the settings, and HP has a dedicated support team for that device to ensure that things run smoothly with a process to pass on tickets to System76 if they're software related. Both teams also worked with AMD to ensure that suspend and resume work as well as possible and they achieved a super, super low TDP on Suspend. So you can be sure that the laptop will not die while it's stored in your backpack. All these improvements have, of course, been upstreamed to the kernel. It doesn't run Core Boot, but this has been discussed between System76 and HP, and it might happen if they make a second generation of that product. Also, all firmware updates will be distributed through LVFS, which is nice, because you won't have to reboot in your dual boot windows to be able to install these updates. Rebooting into Windows. Ooh. Now, there are some kinks to the software. First, you have to agree to a license agreement to use the device. I actually read it and it's bog standard. Here is what license applies to what, we're not liable if you do stupid things, this kind of stuff. Nothing untowards or privacy invasive. Then there's the analytics. It's completely opt-in and not enabled by default. It's a step you have to go through at first setup, but you can say no. If you let them, HP will collect a lot of data about the device. Nothing personal or linked to what you've actually done on the device. It's all hardware related, like system temps, battery health, fan tachometry, and driver versions. If you decide to opt in, you can always opt out in the future from the privacy settings, and you can even delete all analytics on server in one click. Now, the license agreement and analytics will probably ruffle some feathers, but yeah, the license agreement doesn't have anything weird in it, and the analytics can be, like, disabled immediately. You don't even have to enable it to then go and disable it. So, I don't see this as an issue. The rest of the OS is just standard Pop! OS. It works as well as you would expect. But why did HP go with Pop! OS and not, let's say, Ubuntu? Well, it seems that they surveyed a bunch of developers, and Pop! OS is the OS that came the most often. And I guess the experience that System76 has to actually shipping their OS on actual hardware must have helped a lot. Now, the Dev1 can be purchased with two accessories, the HP Wireless Creator Mouse and the Launch Keyboard from System76. While I didn't get that launch keyboard to test things out, because it's not in Europe, I guess, I did get the mouse, and it's a good alternative to the MX Master Series that I use daily. It's very comfortable, with a thumb rest, with a nice scroll wheel that feels good, and that you can switch from free-flowing scrolling or with steps. And it has three configurable buttons. Yes, configurable, because HP made a graphical utility called Mouse Configurator, and it's available in the Pop Shop. It's a graphical tool for Linux to configure that mouse. 
It lets you remap any button to a lot of different actions, either for media playback, browser control, or controlling the OS. There are tons of choices, and you can save your configurations and switch them on the fly, as well as adjust the mouse DPI. It's pretty cool to see this kind of support here, and the mouse uses Bluetooth, but it also comes with a USB adapter if you prefer, so it can be paired with up to three devices, two with Bluetooth and one with the adapter. As per the launch keyboard, it's a highly customizable mechanical keyboard that you can tweak to your liking, swapping keys around, configuring it with a dedicated app, and all configurations are stored on the board itself, so you can take it from one computer to the next and not have to redo all those steps. I hope I can get one and review one once System76 opens their distribution center in Europe. This should happen in the coming month. So, the HP Dev1 is a very interesting device. From a hardware standpoint, it clearly aims at developers that use ThinkPads, and I think it provides a great experience for them. Awesome build quality, fantastic keyboard and trackpad, and that little nipple which is also there for people who like it. The I.O. is powerful, and while the display, camera, and mic are nothing to write home about, they're good enough for the intended target. Performance and battery life are very, very good as well, and user repairability and upgradability is a very nice plus on top of that. The Dev1 is also at a very good price point, 1099 US dollars. For that kind of performance and build quality, you're cheaper than a MacBook Air at comparable performance, build quality, but lower battery life. And so we come to the conclusion. The HP Dev1 is a great device that I can absolutely recommend if you live in the US. If you don't, there is no word yet on when or if this device will come to other countries. I guess that will depend on sales. So, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications. And if you didn't like it, you can also dislike it and tell me why in the comments. And if Granny has been extremely generous at Christmas and you still have leftovers six months after, you can donate using the super thanks button, the PayPal link in the description, or becoming a patron subscriber or a YouTube member. Both get access to a weekly patron cast and the right to vote on the next topics I'll cover. So thanks everyone for watching, and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!